All right, so I'm going to be preaching for the next few weeks on the last days. And if you would open your Bible to the book of Isaiah, chapter 46 and verse 9 and 10, a familiar portion of Scripture with most of us here, but I want us to really look into the last days and try to help us to understand what is, go what is going to be happening in the last days. Why does God give us a, a book and, and a Bible that is so clear and it's so vivid about what is going to be happening in the last days? The Word of God is so vivid and it's so clear about all the things that are going to be conspiring in the last days. It's very clear um, how the Lord has laid out the Word of God and to bring us to this point of the last days, to bring us to the point where we can observe what to see and see what is going on in the last days to prepare us for his return. One of the greatest things you can be is prepared for the return of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have to be prepared for that day. The, the Bible says that that day should not overtake you as a thief. And so we have to be aware of that day, you and I as God's people, by studying the Word of God, by studying to show ourselves approved unto God, that that day, it, as we see it approaching, we are aware of it. Okay? You as a child of God should not be like the world and, and just kind of going through the world and not realizing and not knowing that the day of the Lord will come, the day of Jesus Christ will come, the rapture of the church, which will begin the seven-year tribulation period. But you and I should be aware of these things as a child of God. And the only way you're going to be aware of it is to be in the Word of God, to be studying to show yourself approved unto God. Why do we study the Word of God? Why do we study prophecy? Why do we study all the things that we do? Is That's to prepare you as a child of God. You are to be a prepared person for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are to be preparing for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do we prepare? We're supposed to be about our Father's will. We're supposed to be doing what God has called us to do in these last days. We need to determine the end and say, God, I'm going to do what you have called us to do. Now, we know from studying the Bible that there were going to be several stories about people who were not prepared and not preparing for the return return of the Lord. And you can, we can, we'll look at these things a little bit later on, but there's going to be a lot of Christians that are not prepared and they're not preparing themselves for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what your mind, what is, how your mind works, and you know, praise God, I don't know how your mind works, right? But I do know how my mind works, right? My mind, I want to bring it into, um, into accordance with thus saith the Lord. With what does the Bible say? And I want to study the Word of God because I want to know what is going to happen in the future. I want my, my, my mind and my heart and my eyes to be illuminated to what God is going to be doing. I want to be aware. I don't want that day to overtake me suddenly. I want to know that, that when the Lord comes back, I want to be prepared. And so God has given us signs, he's given us decrees, he's given us a clear illustration in the word of God that his, when his return will be near. And so by studying these times, and the main thing that we study, it's unique, but the Lord reveals the culture of the people and what is going to be happening in the world. But it's always based on the nature of humanity. It's always based on the direction of the culture, the direction of the world, and what is going on in the world, and what humans are doing at this particular point before the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so the last days, you and I have to have, we constantly have these warnings in the Bible about the last days. Throughout the, if you think about it, when you study the Word of God, all of Scripture is pointing you to different events that is going to be showing you what is going to be happening in the last days. All of Scripture. When we study the Word of God, the Word of God is nothing more than prophecy being fulfilled. It's nothing more than you and I studying the Word of God to see what is going to be happening in future events. That's what it all comes down to. The whole Bible and all of human history is to climax to one event, and that is the return of Jesus Christ in the last days of humanity. And so God has given us the Word of God to study, to read, to read, and to study the Bible so we can know what is happening in the last days. Guys, when we look around us and we see all these things happening in the world, we have to equate these things to what is happening right now in our society and through 
throughout the Word of God. And so when we study the Bible, we're always looking for answers. We want to know what is going to be happening. What is the Lord going to be doing? And I'm telling you, the worst thing you can do as a child of God right now is to get comfortable. That is the worst thing you can do in this world and just kind of blow it off as though the Lord's not going to ever come back. That is the worst thing you can do is to let your heart get hard and to let your heart get cold to the things of God where you are not preparing yourself and you're not being prepared for the last times, okay? That is the worst thing you can do as a child of God. And let me tell you something, if you are already at that point in your life where your heart is cold and indifferent towards the things of God and you have fallen in love with this world and you have cultivated yourself deep into this realm of this society, let me tell you something, you better change it and really quick because I'm telling you right now, the worst thing in the world is for a Christian not to be prepared for the return of his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not to be doing the very will of God when he returns. You guys can read about that unprofitable servant. How many of you guys ever read that? Most of you is right. That's it? The unprofitable servant? You guys, that's it? Okay, well, the ones who haven't read it, you better go back and read that thing because that guy is in some serious trouble because when his Lord returned and he didn't get, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do with his talent and his ability, he was in some serious trouble. So you and I have to be prepared. You say, Pastor Mike, that doesn't bother me. Well, if that doesn't bother you, you probably need to get saved. Uh, you get down this altar right now and get you saved and get you born again to the point where it does bother you. And I'll tell you right now, because if that doesn't bother you and that doesn't shake you up and put the fear of God in you, let me tell you something, you are probably without the Holy Spirit of God. All right. And that's pro I'm not making that as to scare you, but I'm making that to make you think. All right. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 46 and verse nine, just briefly. Isaiah, chapter 46 and verse nine. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah here. He says, remember the former things of old, okay? Very clear that you and I are to go back to the things of old. We're to go back to the word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Remember the former things of old. Why? It's because those former things of old are our illustration. The former things of old, they are our lesson. It's Isaiah 46 and verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. Those are the things that God has given to us as a lesson, okay? Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning and our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are what? Are come. So the things that are written in that Bible, they're written for you and they're written for me. The former things, right? Those things that are written in the past, let me tell you something, they're there for you and I to learn from. They're nothing more than illustrations. Are they historical facts? Yes, they are historical facts. They were historical facts. They were documented facts that were written down. Why? For our learning and our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Those things are written. The Bible is written so you and I can look back and see and study what is happening throughout history and what is happening throughout humanity that's why we have the Bible so look at this remember the former things of old we're supposed to remember those things that we've seen when we've read the Word of God and that we studied the Word of God we're supposed to remember all the things that we have seen in all the stories and all the prophecies and all the illustrations that God has given to us we ought to remember those things okay now watch this, for I am God, and say it out loud, there is what? There is none else. We know that there's only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are no other gods. The Bible says all other gods are idols, okay? There is one God, and there is none else. Now look at this, I am God, and there is, say it out loud. There is none like God. There is only one God. There's only one supreme being that has spoken this world into existence. There is no other God. And listen, guys, there is nobody like him. There is no, nothing in the universe is like our God, the God that we serve. Now watch this, right? I am God and there is none like me. And what does he do? Declaring the end from the what? from the beginning so God is gonna tell you what's gonna happen he's gonna declare what is happening in the end but he's gonna bring you all the way back to the beginning and he's going to expound what is going on in the world okay so when we study the Word of God this is what God is doing God is declaring the end from the beginning he's telling you and I what he's going to do and what is going to happen to humanity and to this world this is very clear in the Word of God we read the Bible we study the Bible because we map out God's plan and we want to know what God is doing throughout history. 
It is literally that simple. And some of God's people have just kind of lost focus, okay? And one of the things that is going to make you lose focus is a love for this world. That is it. That is going to set you off course in doing what God has called you to do. That is going to destroy the will of God and the work of God in your life. It's going to hinder you from accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish. And so you know what's going to happen? God's going to bring trials and tribulations and adversity. Listen, in every trial, every tribulation, every adversity, all the things we see happening in this world right now, let me tell you something, those are nothing more than a reminder that God is telling you and I that this this world is not your home that this world is just passing away and you and I are just moving through this life and that this world is not our temporal dwelling we have to understand that and I know that sometimes we get our, our roots so deep into this world that we lose sight of what God is doing we get our roots so deep into this world that we don't answer the call of God and the will of God and the work of God in our lives and sometimes we can get to the point where we, we become so desensitized and we become so demoralized that we just kind of forget God that's what happens so we are no longer being prepared for what God has called us to do God had a relationship with the nation of Israel and over and over and over you could read it throughout the Bible about Jewish history you can see in the book of Judges they turned their back on God there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes they have gotten to the point where they have literally just forsaken God and turned their back on the Lord that's what happens in human history you and I are no different and so we have to determine, like, what are we going to do in this world? How, how you and I, when you come to church, I'm supposed to shake something out of you. And that is your love for this world. Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Because it's all in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We know the verse. We have to come to terms, but this world is not our home. We have to come to terms that we're living in the last days. We have to come to terms that God is declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my good pleasure. That God is working out his plan, that God is working out his purpose in this world. And you and I better get on board in what God is doing. We better get on board in what God is doing. Okay? Now... Before we dive into this, too deep into this, I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 19 now. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter 1, 19 and through 21, it says, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. All right? So we have a, a sure word of prophecy. The Bible is the only sure thing in this world. There isn't anything that is sure in this world. You can't count on having tomorrow. You can't count on your health. You can't count on what the government's going to do. You can't count on what's going to happen in your life. You can't count on anything. The longer you've lived in this world, you're going to come to terms and you realize the only thing you can count on is what the Bible says and thus saith the Lord. That is the only thing we can count on. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Guys, listen, your life can turn around at the drop of a dime. Your life can turn around in a moment's time. Your life can turn around in one second at a, at a time. Listen, the only thing we can count on is the word of God. The only sure thing that we have is the Bible. There isn't anything else that is sure in this world except for the word of God and the principles that will come to pass in the Bible now watch this we also have a more sure word of prophecy where whereunto you do well that you take heed in other words we have a more sure word of prophecy we have the word of God and we we better take heed to it okay we better have some sort of response to the word of God we better have some sort of you know relationship with the word of God we better take heed to what the Bible says now, I don't know what it is, but there are a lot of Christians out there who don't read the Bible. I, I, don't, I can't figure that out. They don't meditate on Scripture. They don't study the Word of God. I don't know where that comes from, right? Listen, because the day you were born again, you should have been crying out as a newborn babe desires the what? The sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Maybe something happened at your supposable, your supposable conversion, Okay? But you should be engulfing yourself in the word of God. Now watch this. 
We also have a more sure word of prophecy, the Bible, whereunto you take heed. We listen to what God says in the scriptures as a what? As a light that shineth what, people? In a dark place. Of course we study the Bible because that is our light. We're living in a dark world where the world is getting darker and darker and darker. And listen, we read the word of God because it's the only light that we have. It's the only direction that we have. It's the only vision that we have. It's the only way we can see clearly is through the word of God and through the very pages of scripture. Outside of that, outside of you using the light of the word of God, even as a child of God, you could still walk in darkness. If you're not in the Word of God, you are still walking in darkness. You are still not walking according to the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Thy Word is a what? It's a lamp and it's a light under my feet. We study the Word of God. Why? It's so God can open up the future to us. So God can open up the vision to us. So God can reveal what He is doing. So you and I are no longer in darkness. But if you don't read and study... You, even as a child of God, you're still walking in darkness. You have no light. I mean, the first thing you do is in, in, in a pitch dark situation, what's the first thing you do? You reach for the flashlight. You reach for something. Why? And especially at a time when times are crucial and there's adversity all around us and there's trials and tribulations and confusion and we see all these things going on, the first thing we should be doing in the morning is reaching for the light of the glorious gospel. It's the first thing we should be doing. Now watch this, right? He goes on, until uh, take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise where? In your hearts. The day dawn and the day star, that's Jesus Christ, okay? We know exactly who that is. Knowing this first, now stay with me. Peter says, know this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, Okay, now this is why I never interpret the Bible. I bring you to other portions of Scripture to what? To interpret the Word of God. No Scripture is any private interpretation. Now watch this. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Did you see that? The Bible was not written by the will of man. Man wouldn't write such a thing. I tell you right now, man would have elevated himself and made himself look good. Man would have made his salvation dependent upon his good deeds or his good morality. Man would have altered, the, man would have erased hell, by the way. Man would never write such a place called hell and, and, and allow and to see himself going there without Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You know that this book is supernatural written because man would have altered it and perverted it and twisted it. That's what man would have done. Man would have elevated himself. Now watch this. It didn't come in old time by the will of man. You see that? But holy men of God, they spake as they were what? As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Those holy men of God, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost just prompted them and probed them and told them exactly what to write. They were under the anointing of the Spirit of God, and God gave them a clear vision and a clear understanding of what to proclaim and what to put down. So when we study the Word of God, there's a purpose and there's a reason behind it, because we know that the Scriptures are true. We study the Word of God because we want to know what's going to happen in the future. I want to know just before the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be so ready for the rapture that when the Lord comes, I'm just sitting there just going, okay, boom. Amen. Amen. Now, some of us live our lives as though the rapture isn't even real. You ever think about that? I mean, Jesus says he comes as a what? As a thief in the night. Now, if you believe that there was a thief coming in your house at a certain time, at a certain night, you would be sitting there, you know, clocked and ready to go, right? Well, then, wait a second. Let me ask you the question. Then why are you guys not ready for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Think about it, for real. Man, we're just like, oh, yeah, he's coming back. Yeah, yeah. Let's just kind of hang out and doze off and... The Bible says, for it is now high time to what? Awake out of sleep. For now is your salvation nearer when you first believe the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. See, if you really believed, you wouldn't be doing the things you're doing. <laughs> Chilling out. <laughs> you wouldn't be doing that, guys. 
If you really believed, you'd be like prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what you'd be doing? You'd be out there witnessing every time you had an opportunity. Why? It's because, man, m imagine that. The rapture takes place, and here you are. You're witnessing to a bunch of people, and you're telling them about Jesus Christ. Man, and Jesus Christ comes back. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. But imagine being in the predicament where you're doing something you ought not to have been doing. It's not going to be a good feeling. Now, Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and then we'll get to our text and we'll lay out the groundwork of where we'll be going for the next several weeks. 2 Timothy 3.16. So here it says that 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All right? That means that the word of God is inspired. Holy men of God, they speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, okay? So now we see that all Scripture, that now when we say all Scripture, we are referencing directly to the King James Bible, 1611. The ASV, the NIV, they are not inspired. Does everyone understand that? Those Bibles are corrupt. Okay, they're not inspired. They come from the corrupt manuscripts that go back all the way to Alexandria and Egypt, and Satan had his people uh, formulating the corrupt translations and the corrupt lineage of Bibles. They're not even Bibles. So now when we say all scripture is given by inspiration, I'll I know a lot of people want to say, oh, the RSV, the ASV, the NIV. No, 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 no. We are speaking directly and solely to the authorized version. Okay? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, that means that all the whole canon of the word of God is inspired. It means that it's God-breathed. That holy men of God, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay? So now, and it says here, and it's what? It's profitable for you and I. It's profitable for doctrine, which means teaching, okay? So the Word of God, it's profitable for doctrine. The Word of God is what teaches us. It is what expounds to you and I prophetic truth. Things that are going to be happening in the future, okay? I want to know the future. I want to know, and listen, I want to know the future, but I'm not going to go see some fortune teller, am I? <laughs> Absolutely not. i got a book that tells me the future. I've got a book that I can count on instead of some demonic source and some sort of demonic witch that it thinks she knows some sort of truth when she doesn't. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now notice this, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and in righteousness. So the word of God, it's, it's given to us by inspiration, okay? Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And this is going to be our primary thrust of what we're going to be studying in Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to look at 1 through 5. Matthew 24, 1 through 5, okay? Now... This is a, a, a great portion of scripture, very clear in the word of God. Matthew chapter 24, 1 through 5. And Jesus went, up, went, went out and he departed from, from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him, uh, show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto, unto them, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that ye shall not that shall not be thrown down now we know that Jesus was prophesying here with Titus when he took down the temple but that's not what we're going to be looking at but it was a prophecy given now look at verse 3 and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privily saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy what of thy coming and of the what did everyone see that so the disciples are like Lord tell us at the what what is what is it going to be like before you come back to this world and Lord what else is it going to be like at the end of the world so Jesus goes on and he literally expounds their question he gives them a, an illustration of the end of the world and what's going to be happening okay so he answers the question very clearly, very distinctly, okay? So the question is, once again, what is the sign of your coming before you return to this world, and what is going to be happening at the end of the world? So it's very clear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, now notice the first thing that he addresses here. Take heed that no man what? Deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall what? Deceive many. 
So this is a very significant question, is it not? The disciples say, Lord, what is it going to be like before you come back to this world? What is going to be happening? And Lord, what is it going to be like at the end of the world? What is going to be happening? And the first thing that he addressed is the concept of deception. That people are going to be deceived. That's the first thing he addressed. He didn't tell them, like, oh, don't, don't, I mean, hey, there's going to be all the nations are going to come against Israel. Nope, he didn't say that first. He didn't say that you're going to see all types of horrific things going on in the world. Which he could have. But the number one thing that he addresses, the very first thing that he addresses, is the false teachers. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall what? Deceive many. The first thing he addresses is that people will be led astray in the name of Jesus Christ. We live in a society today, in a culture today, where there are churches and churches and churches and churches and churches. You can drive within a 10-mile radius, and you'll drive by 20 or 30 churches. You can turn on that internet, you can turn on the TV, you can look at televangelists and televangelists and women preachers, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. And all of this is done in the name of Jesus Christ. So now we have to determine, well, what is truth? Well, we know the King James Bible is truth, thy word is truth. So now we have to determine, well, what are the false teachers? How does Jesus describe these? How does it, now, now, now think about this, guys, right? When you study the Bible, this is crazy, right? Every book in the Bible deals with false teachers. Did you know that? Every book in the Bible. I mean, you go all the way back to the Old Testament. They had false prophets back then. When you study the Word of God, book after book, when you get to the New Testament, by the time you get up there, Jesus mentioned all, in all the Gospels about the false teachers. When you get in the book of Acts, Paul warns the people that grievous wolves shall come up and lead people astray in Acts chapter 20. Boy, when you get to Romans, false teaching, 1 Corinthians, false teaching, 2 Corinthians, false teachings, Galatians, it says, who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you that you should follow another gospel, obey another gospel? The number one thing that we're facing right now in the culture and the society that we live in is false teachers. And, and, and Christians are just too dumb to understand that. They think, oh, well, we should just leave them alone. That's not what the Bible says. Well, they're good people. No, they're not. Jesus calls them wolves in what? Wolves in cheap clothing. Now, I know a lot of people get offended, but let's just look at this. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, 17, and 18. Romans 16, 17, and 18. Okay, so let's look at this, right? Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Paul is writing here. Now Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, say it out loud, mock them which cause what? Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Does the Bible tell you to avoid them? Does the Bible tell you to mock them? You remember Paul pointed out uh, Demas? He says, Demas has forsaken me. Remember that? You remember Paul pointed out Alexander the coppersmith? You guys remember that? You remember Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 23? He looked at those Pharisees and he called them a bunch of snakes, a bunch of vipers. You know what Jesus did? He mocked them. Jesus literally looked at them and he mocked them. He pointed them out and he says, you are mocked. He mocked those religious leaders. Our responsibility is to mark them, to point them out. That's what it is. The Cleflo Dollars, the Joel Olsteins, the Joyce Myers, uh, uh, T.D. Jakes, and you, we can go on and on and on. Rattlesnake Eyes, <laughs> what's his real name? Cope, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Benny Hen. They're a bunch of, literally, guys, and I'm going to prove to you in just a minute, but they're using the Word of God to become millionaires, and Christians are too dumb to even see it. The Bible says, mock them. 
Well, what do you mean you're supposed to point them out? Yeah, you're supposed to point them out. Just like somebody was a sex predator, you know what we do? We'd, we'd point them out. We'd point them out, right? You go down to the police station, and they got pictures of those guys up there. You say, why do they put a picture of them? Because they're mocked. And by the way, the false preachers, the false prophets, never preach on false preaching or false prophets. Have you ever noticed that? They want to take the scriptures and they want to twist them to their own destruction. They want to literally rest the scriptures to their own destruction and make the Bible suitable for what they're trying to bring across. This concept that God wants everyone rich, prove it to me in the Bible. All the disciples lived the life of poverty and brokenness. Now watch this, right? Now I beseech you, brethren, mock them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. So it says we're supposed to mock these people. In other words, we point them out. Does everyone understand that? We mock them. So when these guys are shouting out their names, you know what they're doing? They're mocking them. They're not mocking them. They're mocking them. Okay? Now watch this, right? And now the Bible tells us, right, that it's contrary to the doctrine which we have learned. And it tells you to what? Say it out loud. It tells you to what? Avoid them. It's very clear. It tells you to what? Avoid them. Stay away from them. Now look at verse 18. For they that are such serve, not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own what? Whoa, man, God, man. In other words, they're serving their own desires. They're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They're serving their own belly. They're serving their own pocket and their well-being. They are looking for literally using the name of Christianity and Christianity and the word of God to what? To make money to become millionaires. Google the net worth on all of them. You know, this whole thing, you know, Joyce Myers and all that. Now, listen, guys, a woman's never called to be a preacher. It's completely, you, you, I don't, even, don't even get me going on it, but it's completely demonic. Read 1 Corinthians, read Timothy. It, it, it's demonic and it's evil. The Bible says every woman that prays or prophesies having her head uncovered, it says she dishonors, his, she dishonors her husband and she dishonors God. A woman could speak the truth, but if she's not to be in that position to speak truth, she's dishonoring God. kind of looks like the joker look at her lips too you ever see her lips she's got so much botox in them you know and, and guys listen and listen guys this is what's happening and yet you've got dumb people christians you know grown men that'll sit there like this looking at her it's like what are you thinking and holler amen exactly now watch this for they serve they such serve not our lord jesus christ but what do they do but by their but they serve their own belly their own desires okay their own fleshly wants their own fleshly passions their own fleshly things that they desire that's what they serve now watch this though and by good words and fair speech what do they do you see that so by good words and what fair speech they deceive the hearts of the who the simple well, who's the simple? <laughs> Not this church. <laughs> I'm going to make sure if you come to this church, you ain't going to be simple, right? The simple is the dumb. You guys get that, right? That's who the simple is. The simple are the people who don't know what's going on. They don't know the difference between different translations. They don't know the authority of the King James Bible. They don't know anything about truth. They don't know that a woman's ought not to preach. They don't know that there's a prosperity gospel that is being preached all over this country and all over this world because the simple just fall prey to those things because they haven't been taught. But notice what it says. And by good words and what? Fair speeches, good words, you know what that means? It means telling you what you want to hear. Just like in the book of Isaiah, it says, prophesy unto us what? Smooth things. They literally, the, the people was telling the prophets, prophesy unto us deceit. That's what the people wanted. And God says, if that's what you want, that's what I'll raise up. And I'll put a lying spirit in the mouth of those prophets. And you people will want what they're telling you to, want, want to listen to what they're telling you. 
those people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to come to a Bible-based church. They want to listen to the good words and the fair speeches. Teachers having what? Itching ears. And they're going to turn away their ears from the truth and they will be given heed to fables. That's where we're going. The first warning that Jesus gives us in the last days is about the false prophets. Imagine that. That's the first thing he gives us. The very first he. Now, look back at Matthew again. Matthew 24, right? They're asking Jesus once again about the last days and his return. What's going to be happening in the last days? And the first warning that he gives them. Look at that again, right? In verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man what? deceive you don't be deceived for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and say it out loud shall what shall deceive many okay now drop down to Matthew 24 look at verse 11 he gives another specific warning in verse 11 in the same content of everything that he's expounding he goes back and he repeats himself in verse uh, 24 verse 11 and many false prophets shall arise and shall say it out loud deceive many right now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus gives us another illustration of this. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Man, Jesus always taught on false teachers, right? I mean, man, Jesus was, man, you want to say Jesus repeated himself? Oh yeah, he did. You want to know why? Because some people are too dumb to listen and you've got the simple out there. And sometimes when people are simple, you've got to what? You've got to remind them, right? you got to remind them over and over and over. How many guys ever had to tell your kids something one time and that was it? <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? you got to tell them over and over and over and over again. Why? It's because if you don't remind them, they're going to be running off. If you don't remind them, hey, brush your teeth at night, wash your hands at night. Let me tell you something, nine out of ten times they'll just fall asleep. So look at this, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and through 15. Now watch this. Jesus gives the illustration here. He says, enter in at the straight gate. Now this is very important. Verse 13 and 14 are very important because they connect us to verse 15. Enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few be there that find it. Now watch what he says here. Beware of what? False prophets. Watch this, right? Which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravenous wolves. Now let's just pause there for a minute. He says, beware of these false prophets, right? And verse 13 and 14 connect us to verse 15, okay? So the problem is, is that people are not going to find the straight gate because wide is the gate that leads, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why? It's because of the false prophets. Did you guys get that? Remember, Jesus doesn't just, you know, randomly throw things out there. Listen, he's trying to show you the problem is, is that the gate is broad that's going to lead people to hell. Why? It's because of the false prophets because of the false teachers okay now watch this right he says beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing now remember the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray all right remember in John chapter what is it John chapter 10 I believe it is where Jesus is talking about himself being the good shepherd okay and then he says I have sheep and then I have other sheep that are not of this fold okay so a Christian is compared to a sheep all right. So now Jesus says they come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they come to you as though they're Christians. They come to you as though they're gentle and docile. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they pretend that they're Christians and that they are the very sheep following the shepherd. Well, you know what shepherd they're following? It's called the idol shepherd in Zechariah. How does it spell it? I-D-O-L. That's how they spell it. You know what that idol shepherd is? It's the Antichrist. And you know what the idol shepherd is? Watch this guy. Stay with me. You know what it is? It's all about money. It's all about money. It's all about money. 
They are following the idol shepherd. Beware of the false, look at this, the false, uh, the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're what? Ravening wolves. Well, what does a wolf do? A wolf is devouring and destroying. We need to be aware of this. That just because a church has a, a name, Christian or whatever, or there's a church, don't think that it's a church and by all means don't think that they're Christians because Satan comes as a, as a sheep in wolves clothing now turn to 2nd Corinthians 11 let's look at this we all know this but let's look at it anyways right 2nd Corinthians 11 2nd Corinthians 11 2 Corinthians 11, watch this, right? For such are false apostles, stay with me, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, watch this, transforming themselves into the apostles of who? Of Christ. Do you guys see that? They transform themselves as though they're the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. There's the wolves in sheep's clothing. Now Satan transforms himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his what? Ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. He says that Satan's ministers, he has ministers. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, Satan's ministers, also be transformed as what? The ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Very clear in the word of God. Now we could sit here and go through a whole list of them, but you guys should have enough understanding and studying the Bible to know who they are and where they occur. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. Peter gives the warning here. He takes heed to the very words of Jesus Christ himself. He says, but there were false prophets among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, sneakily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and, br and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And look what it says in verse 2. And many shall follow their what? Perniscuous ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And, and watch this. And through what? Say it aloud. And through covetousness, they with framed words will make what? Did you guys see that? They are out there to fulfill their own covetousness. And they're going to make merchandise out of who? Out of you as the people. Yeah, buy my CD. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how about this one? Um, you buy this handkerchief and, and you'll be blessed. Or sow a seed of this money. And you got people out there that are making them millionaires. And through covetousness shall, look at this, they with framed words make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not. And their damnation slumbereth not. It's coming. Judgment's coming. Judgment day will come upon those false teachers and those false preachers that used the word of God to make them millionaires. They use people with framed words and they make merchandise out of people, out of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. You imagine that? And through covetousness, Shall they with framed words make merchandise of you? You guys see those big churches, the Joel Osteen's with those stadiums of people? Thousands and thousands of people in those stadiums? You think he's preaching on hell? The wrath and the judgment of God? You think he's preaching on false teachers? <laughs> he can't. Because he is one. And everything they do is they're using the Bible as a motivational lesson now. It's no longer thus saith the Lord. 
and they have taken the scriptures and they've altered them and they've perverted them to such an extent where they're taking the true doctrinal application or the teaching and they're twisting it and they're using framed words to make merchandise out of people and they're preaching prosperity. Watch this, guys. Turn to 1 Timothy, right? Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, just really quick, because I do want to wrap this up. But look at this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, right? It says here, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Paul says here, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assault authority, all right, over the man. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. I suffer a woman not to teach nor to assault authority over a man, but to be in silence, right? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And uh, Adam was not deceived, the woman being deceived was in transgression. So Paul is very clear in the scripture, right? He's writing, first of all, a pastoral epistle. He's telling Timothy how to structure his church. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, yes, the women can be there. Yes, they can have partation and things, but they're not to have authority over man. They're not to usurp authority over man. They're not to be a preacher. It's very clear in the word of God. Now watch this, right? In, in turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. It says here, let your, women, uh, let your women keep silent in the churches. Now, it doesn't mean you can't talk in the sense. It means not having authority in preaching, okay? For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law, saith the law. okay? So now there's a structure there. Okay, and what do you have? So just like at the house, you have the, the, the man, he's the head of the house, then the, you have the wife, then you have the children. Well, in the church, you have God's the authority of the church, then you have the pastor, then you have the men, and then you have the women. There's a structure to what God does, okay? There's an order. God is not the order of confusion. He's not the author of confusion, okay? Now, let's just see if we can tie all this together. So go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and we'll pick it right up in verse 1, okay? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says here, Beloved, it says, Believe not every spirit, but what? Try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So now John is addressing this. John says, hey, do not believe every spirit. Okay, so anytime you turn that television on or YouTube or go on on the radio, whatever, there is a spirit out there. So you have to try the spirits. In other words, you have to discern the spirit. Is this the spirit of truth or is this the spirit of error? Is this of God or is it of man? Is this of the truth of the word of God or is this a lie straight from the pit of hell? Now, just because somebody makes a proclamation about the Bible, it doesn't mean that it is still of God because Satan himself is transformed into what an angel of light therefore there's no great thing if his what ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end is according to their works we ought to try the spirits well how do we try the spirits okay well is it in line with the word of God does it line up with what the Bible says okay I mean think about this just for a minute Everything, the whole purpose that Jesus Christ came to this world, he came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. Well, we have to be saved from hell. Any preacher that doesn't believe in hell, he's not a preacher. Any preacher that doesn't teach on hell, he's not a preacher. Any preacher that doesn't turn on the, preach on the return of Jesus Christ, he is not a preacher. I don't care how much he thinks he uses the Bible. Listen, all of the Bible points and it climaxes to the return of Jesus Christ and to the final day of judgment. That's all there is. That's all there is. The day of judgment and the return of Jesus Christ. The Bible is not a book to motivate you. To make you feel good about yourself. It's not. It's not a book where, you know, you're going to come in here and, and I'm going to try to tickle your ears and make you feel good. No, you need to learn the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And you need to depart from evil, which is knowledge. People are using the Bible as nothing more than a motivational lesson. 
they did hip e et the hip hop how many guys seen that guy he's he's so full of himself it's sickening and listen to what these guys talk about they don't talk about heaven they don't talk about hell you know what they talk about money prosperity that's what they talk about they're not talking about thus saith the lord they're not talking about God's holiness. They're not talking about God's wrath. They're not talking about God's justness. They're not talking about the indignation of God. They're not talking about the cup of the wrath of Almighty God being poured out on this world. They're not talking about those things. They're not talking that whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They don't mention any of those things. <clears throat> it would bring too much conviction because that's where they're going. Jesus' address to the end of the world, it begins with false teaching and false prophets. Imagine that. Hey, Jesus, what is it going to be like at the end of the world and just before you come? Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall, what? Deceive many. That is how he begins his, his theses, his theses on the end of the world, he begins it with false teachers. There's an order to what God does. And if he puts that first, that means it has first and preeminence that this is the number one thing we need to watch out for all around us. You drive by, you see these churches with the flags and all these signs, and you go everywhere. I mean, you could drive down to Plymouth, and you'll see church after church after church after church. Well, I thought we were all to get along. No, we're not. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be what? Agreed. Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I come to bring a what? I come to bring a sword. We're not all going to sit there and hold hands and sing kumbaya. We're not going to do it. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for who you are. And Lord, we, just, we do thank you for your goodness and your grace. And for the next few moments, we pray that you'd prepare our hearts for the, for the Lord's Supper, Lord. And um, as, we, as we observe this today, help your people, Lord. Make this thing clear, Lord. We just thank you for everything. In Christ's name.